Introduction to Poems of Nature by Henry David Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Introduction. The fifty poems here brought together under the title Poems of Nature are perhaps two-thirds of those which Thoreau preserved. Many of them were printed by him, in whole or in part, among his early contributions to Emerson's Dial, or in his own two volumes, The Week and Walden, which were all that were issued in his lifetime. Others were given to Mr. Sanborn for publication by Sophia Thoreau, the year after her brother's death. Several appeared in the Boston Commonwealth in 1863 or have been furnished from time to time by Mr. Blake, his literary executor. Most of Thoreau's poems were composed early in his life, before his twenty-sixth year. Just now, he wrote in the autumn of 1841, quote, I am in the mid-sea of verses, and they actually rustle round me, as the leaves would round the head of Autumnus himself, should he thrust it up through some veils which I know. But, alas, many of them are but crisped in yellow leaves like his, I fear, and will deserve no better fate than to make mold for new harvests." Unquote. After 1843, he seems to have written but few poems, and had destroyed perhaps as many as he had retained, because they did not meet the exacting requirements of his friend Emerson, upon whose opinion at that time he placed great reliance. This loss was regretted by Thoreau in after years, when the poetical habit had left him, for he fancied that some of the verses were better than his friend had supposed. But Emerson, who seldom changed his mind, adhered to his verdict, and while praising some of the poems highly, perhaps extravagantly, would omit but a small number of them to the slight selection which he appended to the posthumous edition of Thoreau's letters, edited by him in 1865 and even those were printed, in some instances, in an abbreviated and imperfect form. A few other poems, with some translations from the Greek, have lately been included by Thoreau's Boston publishers in their volume of Miscellanies, volume 10 of the Riverside Edition, 1894, but no collection so full as the present one has ever been offered to the public. It has not been attempted to make this a complete collection of Thoreau's poems, because, as has been well said, many of them seem to be merely pendants to his prose discourse, dropped in as forcible epigrams where they are brief, and in other instances made ancillary to the idea just expressed, or to perpetuate a distinct conception that has some vital connection with the point from which it was poured forth. It is therefore almost an injustice to treat them separately at all. After the discontinuance of the dial, Thoreau ceased to publish his verses as separate poems, but interpolated them in the manner described in his prose essays, where they form a sort of accompaniment to the thought, and from which it is in many cases impossible to detach them. That he himself set some value on them in this connection may be gathered from a sentence in the last of his published letters, in which he writes to a correspondent, quote, I am pleased when you say that in the week you like especially those little snatches of poetry interspersed through the book, for these, I suppose, are the least attractive to most readers. Unquote. Everything that concerns a great writer has its special interest, and Thoreau's poetry, whatever its intrinsic value may be, is full of personal significance. In fact, as Emerson remarked, his biography is his verses. Thus many of these poems will be found to throw light on certain passages of his life. Inspiration, for example, is the record of his soul's awakening to the new impulse of transcendentalism. The stanzas on symphony perhaps contain in a thinly disguised form the story of his youthful love, and the sacrifice which he imposed on himself to avoid rivalry with his brother. The lines to my brother refer to the sudden and tragic death of John Thoreau in 1842, and the departure is believed to be the poem in which Henry Thoreau, when leaving in 1843 the home of Emerson, where he had lived for two years, took farewell of his friends. The numerous other allusions to the life and scenery of Concord, with which Thoreau's own life was so closely blended, require no comment or explanation. 
thoreau's view of the poetic character as stated by him in the week is illustrative of his own position a true poem he says quote, is distinguished not so much by a felicitous expression or any thought it suggests as by the atmosphere which surrounds it there are two classes of men called poets the one cultivates life the other art one seeks food for nutriment the other for flavor one satisfies hunger the other gratifies the palate unquote. there can be no doubt to which of these classes thoreau himself belongs if metrical skill be insisted on as an indispensable condition of poetry he can hardly be ranked among the poets nor where this criterion was dominant was it surprising that as one of his contemporaries tells us with reference to his verses in the dial quote, an unquenchable laughter like that of gods at vulcans limping went up over his ragged and halting lines unquote. but in the appreciation of poetry there is a good deal more to be considered than this and as the same writer has remarked there is quote, a frank and unpretending nobleness unquote. in many of thoreau's verses distinguished as they are at their best by their ripe fullness of thought quiet gravity of tone and epigrammatic terseness of expression the title of poet could hardly be withheld from the author of such truly powerful pieces as the fall of the leaf winter memories smoke in winter or inspiration nor should it be forgotten that thoreau was always regarded as a poet by those who were associated with him poet naturalist was the suggestive title which ellery channing applied to him and hawthorne remarked that quote, his thoughts seem to measure and attune themselves into spontaneous verse as they rightfully may since there is real poetry in them unquote. even emerson's final estimate was far from unappreciative his poetry he wrote in his biographical sketch quote, might be bad or good he no doubt wanted a lyric facility and technical skill but he had the source of poetry in his spiritual perception his own verses are often rude and defective the gold does not yet run pure is drossy and crude the time and majorum are not yet honey but if he want lyric fineness and technical merits if he have not the poetic temperament he never lacks the casual thought showing that his genius was better than his talent unquote. perhaps what thoreau said of quarrels one of that school of gnomic poets of which he was a student might be aptly applied to himself quote, it is rare to find one who was so much of a poet and so little of an artist hopelessly quaint he never doubts his genius it is only he and his god in all the world he uses language sometimes as greatly as shakespeare and though there is not much straight grain in him there is plenty of rough crooked timber unquote. the affinity of thoreau's style through that of herbert dunn cowley and other minor elizabethans has often been remarked and it has been truly said that the stanzas sic vita might almost have a niche in herbert's temple it must be granted then that thoreau whatever his limitations had the poet's vision and sometimes the poet's divine faculty and if this was manifested more frequently in his masterly prose it was neither absent from his verse nor from the whole tenor of his character it was his destiny to be one of the greatest prose writers whom america has produced and he had a strong perhaps an exaggerated sense of the dignity of this calling great prose he thinks quote, of equal elevation commands our respect more than great verse since it implies a more permanent and level height a life more pervaded with the grandeur of the thought the poet only makes an eruption like a parthian and is off again shooting while he retreats but the prose writer has conquered like a roman and settled colonies unquote. if therefore we cannot unreservedly place thoreau among the poetical brotherhood we may at least recognize that he was a poet in the larger sense in which his friends so regarded him he felt thought acted and lived as a poet though he did not always write as one in his own words my life has been the poem i would have writ but i could not both live and utter it such qualities dignify life and make the expression of it memorable not perhaps immediately to the multitude of readers but at first to an appreciative few and eventually to a wide circle of mankind
End of Introduction Nature by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson O nature, I do not aspire to be the highest in thy choir, To be a meteor in the sky, or a comet that may range on high, Only a zephyr that may blow among the reeds by the river low. Give me thy most privy place where to run my airy race. In some withdrawn unpublic mead, let me sigh upon a reed, or in the woods with leafy din whisper the still evening in. Some still work give me to do, only be it near to you. For I'd rather be thy child and pupil in the forest wild than be the king of men elsewhere, and most sovereign slave of care, to have one moment of thy dawn than share the city's year forlorn. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Inspiration by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Whate'er we leave to God, God does, and blesses us. The work we choose should be our own, God leaves alone. If with light head erect I sing, Though all the muses lend their force, From my poor love of anything, The verse is weak and shallow as its source. But if with bended neck I grope, Listening behind me for my wit, With faith superior to hope, More anxious to keep back than forward it, Making my soul accomplice there Unto the flame my heart hath lit, Then will the verse for ever wear, Time cannot bend the line, which God hath writ. Always the general show of things floats in review before my mind, and such true love and reverence brings that sometimes I forget that I am blind. But now there comes unsought, unseen, some clear divine electuary, and I who had but sensual been grow sensible, and as God is, am wary. I hearing get who had but ears, and sight who had but eyes before. I moments live who lived but years, and truth discern who knew but learning's lore. I hear beyond the range of sound, I see beyond the range of sight, new earths and skies and seas around, and in my day the sun doth pale his light. A clear and ancient harmony pierces my soul through all its din, as through its utmost melody farther behind than they farther within more swift its bolt than lightning is its voice than thunder is more loud it doth expand my privacies to all and leave me single in the crowd it speaks with such authority with so serene and lofty tone that idle time runs gadding by and leaves me with eternity alone now chiefly is my natal hour and only now my prime of life of manhood's strength it is the flower Tis peace's end, and war's beginning strife. It comes in summer's broadest noon, By a gray wall, or some chance place, Unseasoning time, insulting June, And vexing day with its presuming face. Such fragrance round my couch it makes, More rich than our Arabian drugs, That my soul scents its life, And wakes the body up beneath its perfumed rugs. Such is the muse, the heavenly maid, the star that guides our mortal course, which shows where life's true kernels laid, its wheat's fine flower, and its undying force. She with one breath attunes the seers, and also my poor human heart with one impulse propels the years around and gives my throbbing pulse its start. I will not doubt for evermore, nor falter from a steadfast faith, for though the system be turned o'er, God takes not back the word which once he saith. I will not doubt the love untold, which not my worth nor want has bought, which wooed me young and woos me old, and to this evening hath me brought. My memory I'll educate to know the one historic truth, remembering to the latest date the only true and sole immortal youth. Be but thy inspiration given, no matter through what danger sought, I'll fathom hell or climb to heaven, 
and yet esteem that cheap which love has bought fame cannot tempt the bard who's famous with his god nor laurel him a reward who has his maker's nod end of poem this recording is in the public domain Sic Vita by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson It is but thin soil where we stand. I have felt my roots in a richer air this. I have seen a bunch of violets in a glass vase, tied loosely with a straw, which reminded me of myself. The Weak I am a parcel of vain strivings, tied by a chance bond together, dangling this way and that, their links were made so loose and wide, methinks, for milder weather. A bunch of violets without their roots, and sorrel intermixed, encircled by a wisp of straw once coiled about their shoots, the law by which I'm fixed. A nosegay which time clutched from out those fair Elysian fields, with weeds and broken stems in haste, doth make the rabble rout that wastes the day he yields and here i bloom for a short hour unseen drinking my juices up with no root in the land to keep my branches green but stand in a bare cup some tender buds were left upon my stem in mimicry of life but ah the children will not know till time has withered them the woe with which they're rife but now i see i was not plucked for naught and after in life's vase of glass set while i might survive but by a kind hand brought alive to a strange place that stock thus thinned will soon redeem its hours and by another year such as god knows with freer air more fruits and fairer flowers will bear while i droop here end of poem this recording is in the public domain the fisher's boy by Henry David Thoreau, read for LibriVox.org, by Larry Wilson. My life is like a stroll upon the beach, as near the ocean's edge as I can go. My tardy steps its waves sometimes o'erreach, sometimes I stay to let them overflow. My sole employment tis, and scrupulous care, to place my gains beyond the reach of tides, each smoother pebble and each shell more rare, which ocean kindly to my hand confides. I have but few companions on the shore. They scorn the strand who sail upon the sea. Yet oft I think the ocean they've sailed o'er is deeper known upon the strand to me. The middle sea contains no crimson dolts. Its deeper waves cast up no pearls to view. Along the shore my hand is on its pulse, and I converse with many a shipwrecked crew. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Atlantides by Henry David Thoreau. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The friend is some fair floating isle of palms, eluding the mariner in Pacific seas. The Weak. The smothered streams of love, which flow more bright than Phlegathon, more low, island us ever like the sea, in an Atlantic mystery. Our fabled shores none ever reach, no mariner has found our beach. Scarcely our mirage now is seen, and neighboring waves with floating green, yet still the oldest charts contain some dotted outline of our main. In ancient times, midsummer days, unto the western islands gaze, to Tenerife and the Azores, have shown our faint and cloud-like shores. But sink not yet, ye desolate isles, anon your coast with commerce smiles, and richer freights ye'll furnish far than Africa or Malabar. Be fair, be fertile evermore, ye rumoured but untrodden shore. Princes and monarchs will contend who first unto your land shall send, and pawn the jewels of the crown, to call your distant soil their own. Sea and land are but his neighbors, and companions in his labors, who on the ocean's verge and firm land's end doth long and truly seek his friend. Many men dwell far inland, but he alone sits on the strand. 
whether he ponders men or books always still he seaward looks marine news he ever reads and the slightest glance heeds feels the sea breeze on his cheek at each word the landsmen speak in every companion's eye a sailing vessel doth descry in the ocean's sullen roar from some distant port he hears of wrecks upon a distant shore and the ventures of past years end of poem this recording is in the public domain the aurora of guido by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson a fragment the god of day his car rolls up the slopes reining his prancing steeds with steady hand the lingering moon through western shadows gropes while morning sheds its light o'er sea and land castles and cities by the sounding main resound with all the busy din of life the fisherman unfurls his sails again and the recruited warrior bides the strife the early breeze ruffles the poplar leaves the curling waves reflect the unseen light the slumbering sea with the day's impulse heaves while o'er the western hill retires the drowsy night the sea-birds dip their bills in ocean's foam far circling out over the frothy waves in the poem this recording is in the public domain sympathy by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson lately alas i knew a gentle boy whose features all were cast in virtue's mould as one she had designed for beauty's toy but after manned him for her own stronghold on every side he open was as day that you might see no lack of strength within for walls and ports do only serve alway for a pretense to feebleness and sin say not that caesar was victorious with toil and strife who stormed the house of fame in other sense this youth was glorious himself a kingdom wheresoe'er he came no strength went out to get him victory when all was income of its own accord for where he went none other was to see but all were parcel of their noble lord he forayed like the subtle haze of summer that still he shows fresh landscapes to our eyes and revolutions work without a murmur of rustling of a leaf beneath the skies so was i taken unawares by this i quite forgot my homage to confess yet now am forced to know though hard it is i might have loved him had i loved him less each moment as we nearer drew to each a stern respect withheld us farther yet so that we seemed beyond each other's reach and less acquainted than when first we met we two were one while we did sympathize so could we not the simplest bargain drive and what avails it now that we are wise if absence doth this doubleness contrive eternity may not the chance repeat but i must tread my single way alone in sad remembrance that we once did meet and know that bliss irrevocably gone the spheres henceforth my elegy shall sing for elegy has other subject none each strain of music in my ear shall ring knell of departure from that other one make haste and celebrate my tragedy with fitting strain resound ye woods and fields sorrow is dearer in such case to me than all the joys other occasion yields it's then too late the damage to repair distance forsooth from my weak grasp has reft the empty husk and clutched the useless tear but in my hands the wheat and kernel left if i but love that virtue which he is though it be scented in the morning air still shall we be truest acquaintances nor mortals nor a sympathy more rare end of poem this recording is in the public domain friendship by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson friends romans countrymen and lovers let such pure hate still under prop our love that we may be each other's conscience and have our sympathy mainly from thence 
we'll one another treat like gods and all the faith we have in virtue and in truth bestow on either and suspicion leave to gods below two solitary stars unmeasured systems far between us roll but by our conscious light we are determined to one pole what need confound the sphere love can afford to wait for it no hours too late that witnesseth one duty's end or to another doth beginning lend it will subserve no use more than the tints of flowers only the independent guest frequents its bowers inherits its bequest no speech though kind has it but kinder silence doles unto its mates by night consoles by day congratulates what saith the tongue to tongue what heareth ear of ear by the decrees of fate from year to year does it communicate pathless the gulf of feeling yawns no trivial bridge of words or arch of boldest span can leap the moat that girds the sincere man no show of bolts and bars can keep the foeman out or scape his secret mind who entered with the doubt that drew the line no warder at the gate can let the friendly in but like the sun or all he will the castle win and shine along the wall there's nothing in the world i know that can escape from love for every depth that goes below and every height above it waits as waits the sky until the clouds go by yet shines serenely on with an eternal day alike when they are gone and when they stay implacable is love foes may be bought or teased from their hostile intent but he goes unappeased who is on kindness bent end of poem this recording is in the public domain true kindness by henry david thoreau read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson true kindness is a pure divine affinity not founded upon human consanguinity it is a spirit not a blood relation superior to family and station end of poem this recording is in the public domain to the maiden in the east by henry david thoreau read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson lo in the eastern sky is set thy glancing eye and though its gracious light ne'er riseth to my sight yet every star that climbs above the gnarled limbs of yonder hill conveys thy gentle will believe i knew thy thought and that the zephyrs brought thy kindest wishes through as mine they bear to you that some attentive cloud did pause amid the crowd over my head while gentle things were said believe the thrushes sung and that the flower bells rung that herbs excelled their scent and beasts knew what was meant the trees a welcome waved and lakes their margins laved when thy free mind to my retreat did wind it was a summer eve the air did gently heave while yet a low-hung cloud by eastern skies did shroud the lightning's silent gleams startling my drowsy dream seemed like the flash under thy dark eyelash from yonder comes the sun but soon his course is run rising to trivial day along his dusty way but thy noontide completes only auroral heats nor ever sets to hasten vain regrets direct thy pensive eye into the western sky and when the evening star does glimmer from afar upon the mountain line accept it for a sign that i am near and thinking of thee here i'll be thy mercury thou cytherea to me distinguished by thy face the earth shall learn my place as near beneath thy light will i outwear the night with mingled ray leading the westward way still will i strive to be as if thou wert with me whatever path i take it shall be for thy sake of gentle slope and wide as thou wert by my side without a root to trip thy gentle foot i'll walk with gentle pace and choose the smoothest place and careful dip the oar and shun the winding shore and gently steer my boat where water-lilies float and cardinal flowers stand 
in their sylvan bowers. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Free Love by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson My love must be as free as the eagle's wing, Hovering o'er land and sea, and everything. I must not dim my eye in thy saloon, I must not leave my sky and nightly moon. Be not the fowler's net which stays my flight, And craftily is set to allure the sight but be the favoring gale that bears me on and still doth fill my sail when thou art gone i cannot leave my sky for thy caprice true love would soar as high as heaven is the eagle would not brook her mate thus one who trained his eye to look beneath the sun end of poem this recording is in the public domain Rumors from an Aeolian Harp by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson There is a vale which none hath seen, Where foot of man has never been, Such as here lives with toil and strife, An anxious and a sinful life. There every virtue has its birth, Ere it descends upon the earth, And thither every deed returns, Which in the generous bosom burns there love is warm and youth is young and poetry is yet unsung for virtue still adventures there and freely breathes her native air and ever if you hearken well you still may hear its vesper bell and tread of high-souled men go by their thoughts conversing with the sky in the poem this recording is in the public domain Lines by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Though all the fates should prove unkind, Leave not your native land behind. The ship be calmed at length stand still, The steed must rest beneath the hill, But swiftly still our fortunes pace To find us out in every place. The vessel, though her mast be firm, Beneath her copper bears a worm, Around the cape, across the line till fields of ice her course confine it matters not how smooth the breeze how shallow or how deep the seas whether she bears manila twine or in her hold madeira wine or china teas or spanish hides in port or quarantine she rides far from new england's blustering shore new england's worm her hulk shall bore and sink her in the indian seas twine wine and hides and china teas in the poem this recording is in the public domain stanzas by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson before each van prick forth the airy knights and couch their spears till thickest legions close with feats of arms from either end of heaven the welkin burns. Away, 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 ye have not kept your secret well. I will abide that other day, those other lands ye tell. Has time no leisure left for these, the acts that ye rehearse? Is not eternity at least for better deeds than verse? Tis sweet to hear of heroes dead, to know them still alive but sweeter if we earn their bread, and in us they survive. Our life should feed the springs of fame with perennial wave, as ocean feeds the babbling founts, which find in it their grave. Ye skies drop gently round my breast, and be my corslet blue. Ye earth, receive my lance and rest, my faithful charger you. Ye stars, my spearheads in the sky, my arrow tips ye are. I see the routed foemen fly, my bright spears fixed are. Give me an angel for a foe, fix now the place and time, and straight to meet him I will go above the starry chime. And with our clashing buckler's clang the heavenly spheres shall ring, while bright the northern light shall hang beside our tourneying. And if she lose her champion true, tell heaven not despair, 
for I will be her champion new, her fame I will repair. In the poem. This recording is in the public domain. A River Scene by Henry David Thoreau. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The river swelleth more and more, like some sweet influence stealing o'er the passive town, and for a while each tussock makes a tiny isle, where on some friendly air rat resteth the weary water rat. No ripple shows musketaquid, her very currents e'en is hid. As deepest souls do commest rest, when thoughts are swelling in the breast, and she that in the summer's drought doth make a rippling and a rout sleeps her nasha tuck to the cliff unruffled by a single skiff but by a thousand distant hills the louder roar a thousand rills and many a spring which now is dumb and many a stream with smothered hum doth swifter well and faster glide though buried deep beneath the tide our village shows a rural venice its broad lagoons where yonder fen is as lovely as the bay of naples yon placid cove amid the maples and in my neighbor's field of corn i recognize the golden horn here nature taught from year to year when only red men came to hear methinks twas in this school of art venice and naples learned their part but still their mistress to my mind her young disciples leaves behind End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. River Song by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Ply the oars, away, away. In each dewdrop of the morning lies the promise of a day. Rivers from the sunrise flow, springing with the dewy morn. Voyagers gainst time do row idle noon nor sunset no ever even with the dawn since that first away away many a lengthy reach we've rode still the sparrow on the spray hastes to usher in the day with her simple stanzaed ode in the poem this recording is in the public domain some tumultuous little rill by Henry David Thoreau, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Some tumultuous little rill, purling round its storied pebble, tinkling to the self-same tune from September until June, which no drought doth e'er enfeeble. Silent flows the parent stream, and if rocks do lie below, smothers with her waves the din, as it were with youthful sin, just as still and just as slow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Boat Song by Henry David Thoreau. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Thus, perchance, the Indian hunter, many a lagging year agone, gliding o'er thy rippling waters, lowly hummed a natural song. Now the sun's behind the willows. Now he gleams along the waves, faintly o'er the wearied billows, come the spirits of the braves. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To My Brother by Henry David Thoreau. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Brother, where dost thou dwell? What sun shines for thee now? Dost thou indeed farewell, as we wish thee here below? What season didst thou find? Twas winter here. Are not the fates more kind than they appear? Is thy brow clear again, and in thy youthful years? And was that ugly pain the summit of thy fears? Yet thou wast cheery still. They could not quench thy fire. Thou didst abide their will, and then retire. Where chiefly shall I look to feel thy presence near? Along the neighboring brook may I thy voice still hear? Dost thou still haunt the brink of yonder river's tide? And may I ever think that thou art by my side? 
what bird will thou employ to bring me word of thee for it would give them joy twould give them liberty to serve their former lord with wing and minstrelsy a sadder strain mixed with their song they've slowly or built their nests since thou art gone their lively labor rests where is the finch the thrush i used to hear ah they could well abide the dying year now they no more return i hear them not they have remained to mourn or else forgot end of poem this recording is in the public domain stanzas by henry david thoreau read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson nature doth have her dawn each day but mine are far between content i cry for sooth to say mine bright as are i ween for when my sun doth deign to rise though it be her noontide her fairest field in shadow lies nor can my light abide sometimes i bask me in her day conversing with my mate but if we interchange one ray forthwith her heats abate through his discourse i climb and see as from some eastern hill a brighter morrow rise to me than lieth in her skill as twere two summer days in one two sundays come together our rays united make one sun with fairest summer weather in the poem this recording is in the public domain the inward morning by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson packed in my mind lie all the clothes which outward nature wears and in its fashions hourly change it all things else repairs in vain i look for change abroad and can no difference find till some new ray of peace uncalled illumes my inmost mind what is it gilds the trees and clouds and paints the heavens so gay but yonder fast abiding light with its unchanging ray lo when the sun streams through the wood upon a winter's morn where'er his silent beams intrude the murky night is gone how could the patient pine have known the morning breeze would come or humble flowers anticipate the insect's noonday hum till the new light with morning cheer from far streamed through the aisles and it nimbly told the forest trees for many stretching miles i've heard within my inmost soul such cheerful morning news in the horizon of my mind have seen such orient hues as in the twilight of the dawn when the first birds awake are heard within some silent wood where they the small twigs break or in the eastern skies are seen before the sun appears the harbingers of summer heats which from afar he bears in the poem this recording is in the public domain greece by henry david thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. When life contracts into a vulgar span, and human nature tires to be a man, I thank the gods for Greece, that permanent realm of peace. For as the rising moon far in the night checkers the shade with her forerunning light, so in my darkest hour my senses seem to catch from her acropolis a gleam greece who am i that i should remember thee thy marathon and thy thermopylae is my life vulgar my fate mean which on such golden memories can lean end of poem this recording is in the public domain the funeral bell by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson one more is gone out of the busy throng that tread these paths the church bell tolls its sad knell rolls to many hearths flower bells toll not their echoes roll not upon my ear there still perchance that gentle spirit haunts a fragrant bier low lies the pall lowly the mourners all their passage grope 
though sable hue mars the serene blue of heaven's cope in distant dell faint sounds the funeral bell a heavenly chime some poet there weaves the light burthened air into sweet rhyme end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Summer Rain by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson My books I'd fain cast off, I cannot read. Twixt every page my thoughts go stray at large, Down in the meadow where is richer feed, And will not mind to hit their proper targe. Plutarch was good, and so was Homer too. Our Shakespeare's life were rich to live again. But Plutarch read, that was not good nor true, nor Shakespeare's books, unless his books were men. Here, while I lie beneath this walnut bough, what care I for the Greeks or for Troy town? If juster battles are enacted now between the ants upon this hummock's crown, bid Homer wait till I the issue learn. If red or black, the gods will favor most, or yonder Ajax will the phalanx turn struggling to heave some rock against the host tell shakespeare to attend some leisure hour for now i've business with this drop of dew and see you not the clouds prepare a shower i'll meet him shortly when the sky is blue this bed of herd grass and wild oats was spread last year with nicer skill than monarchs use a clover tuft as pillow for my head and violets quite overtop my shoes and now the cordial clouds have shut all in, And gently swells the wind to say, All's well. The scattered drops are falling fast and thin, Some in the pool, some in the flower bell. I am well drenched upon my bed of oats, But see, that globe come rolling down its stem, Now, like a lonely planet, there it floats, And now it sinks into my garment's hem. Drip drip the trees for all the country round and richness rare distills from every bough the wind alone it makes every sound shaking down crystals on the leaves below for shame the sun will never show himself who could not with his beams e'er melt me so my dripping locks they would become an elf who in beaded coat does gaily go End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Mist by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Low-anchored cloud, Newfoundland air, Fountainhead and source of rivers, Dewcloth, dream drapery, And napkin spread by fays, Drifting meadow of the air, Where bloom the daisied banks and violets, and in whose finny labyrinth the bittern booms and heron wades spirit of lakes and seas and rivers bear only perfumes and the scent of healing herbs to just men's fields in the poem this recording is in the public domain smoke by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson Light-winged smoke, a carrion bird, Melting thy pinions in thy upward flight, Lark without song, and messenger of dawn, Circling above thy hamlets as thy nest, Or else departing dream and shadowy form Of midnight vision, gathering up thy skirts By night star veiling, and by day darkening the light And blotting out the sun. Go thou, my incense, upward from this hearth, and ask the gods to pardon this clear flame. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Haze by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Woof of the sun, ethereal gauze Woven of nature's richest stuffs, Visible heat, air water and dry sea last conquest of the eye 
toil of the day displayed sun-dust aerial surf upon the shores of earth ethereal estuary frith of light breakers of air billows of heat fine summer spray on inland seas bird of the sun transparent winged owlet of noon soft pinioned from heath or stubble rising without song establish thy serenity o'er the fields end of poem this recording is in the public domain the moon by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson time wears her not she doth his chariot guide mortality below her orb is placed raleigh the full orbed moon with unchanged ray mounts up the eastern sky not doomed to these short nights for aye but shining steadily she does not wane but my fortune which her rays do not bless my wayward path declineth soon but she shines not the less and if she faintly glimmers here and paled is her light yet always in her proper sphere she's mistress of the night end of poem this recording is in the public domain the vireo by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson upon the lofty elm tree sprays the vireo rings the changes sweet during the trivial summer days striving to lift our thoughts above the street end of poem this recording is in the public domain the poet's delay by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson in vain i see the morning rise in vain observe the western blaze who idly look to other skies expecting life by other ways amidst such boundless wealth without i only still am poor within the birds have sung their summer out but still my spring does not begin shall i then wait the autumn wind compelled to seek a milder day and leave no curious nest behind no wood still echoing to my lay in the poem this recording is in the public domain lines by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson all things are current found on earthly ground spirits and elements have their descents night and day year on year high and low far and near these are our own aspects these are our own regrets ye gods of the shore who abide evermore i see your far headland stretching on either hand i hear the sweet evening sounds from your undecaying grounds cheat me no more with time take me to your clime in the poem this recording is in the public domain nature's child by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson i am the autumnal sun with autumn gales my races run when will the hazel put forth its flowers or the grape ripen under my bowers when will the harvest or the hunter's moon turn my midnight into mid-noon i am all sear and yellow and to my core mellow the mast is dropping within my woods the winter is lurking within my moods and the rustling of the withered leaf is the constant music of my grief end of poem this recording is in the public domain the fall of the leaf by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson thank god who seasons thus the year and sometimes kindly slants his rays for in his winter he's most near and plainest seen upon the shortest days 
who gently tempers now his heats and then his harsher cold lest we should surfeit on the summer sweets or pine upon the winter's crudity a sober mind will walk alone apart from nature if need be and only its own season's own for nature leaving its humanity sometimes a late autumnal thought has crossed my mind in green july and to its early freshness brought late ripened fruits and an autumnal sky the evening of the year draws on the fields a later aspect wear since summer's garishness is gone some grains of night tincture the noontide air behold the shadows of the trees now circle wider about their stem like sentries that by slow degrees perform their rounds gently protecting them and as the year doth decline the sun allows a scantier light behind each needle of the pine there lurks a small auxiliar to the night i hear the cricket's slumbrous lay around beneath me and on high it rocks the night it soothes the day and everywhere is nature's lullaby but most he chirps beneath the sod when he has made his winter bed his creek grown fainter but more broad a film of autumn o'er the summer spread small birds and fleets migrating by now beat across some meadow's bay and as they tack and veer on high with faint and hurried click beguile the way far in the woods these golden days some leaf obeys its maker's call and through their hollow aisles it plays with delicate touch the prelude of the fall gently withdrawing from its stem it lightly lays itself along where the same hand hath pillowed them resigned to sleep upon the old year's throng the loneliest birch is brown and sear the furthest pool is strewn with leaves which float upon their watery bier where is no eye that sees no heart that grieves the jay screams through the chestnut wood the crisped and yellow leaves around are hue and texture of my mood and these rough burrs my heirlooms on the ground the threadbare trees so poor and thin they are no wealthier than i but with as brave a core within they rear their boughs to the october sky poor knights they are which bravely wait the charge of winter's cavalry keeping a simple roman state discumbered of their persian luxury end of poem this recording is in the public domain smoke in winter by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson the sluggish smoke curls up from some deep dell the stiffened air exploring in the dawn and making slow acquaintance with the day delaying now upon its heavenward course in wreathed loiterings dallying with itself with as uncertain purpose and slow deed as its half-wakened master by the hearth whose mind still slumbering and sluggish thoughts have not yet swept into the onward current of the new day and now it streams afar the while the chopper goes with step direct and mind intent to wield the early axe first in the dusky dawn he sends abroad his early scout his emissary smoke the earliest latest pilgrim from the roof to feel the frosty air inform the day and while he crouches still beside the hearth nor musters courage to unbar the door it has gone down the glen with the light wind and o'er the plain unfurled its venturous wreath draped the tree-tops loitered upon the hill and warmed the pinions of the early bird and now perchance high in the crispy air has caught sight of the day o'er the earth's edge and greets its master's eye at his low door as some refulgent cloud in the upper sky in the poem this recording is in the public domain winter memories by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson within the circuit of this plodding life 
there enter moments of an azure hue untarnished fair as is the violet or an enemy when the spring strews them by some meandering rivulet which make the best philosophy untrue that aims but to console man for his grievances i have remembered when the winter came high in my chamber in the frosty nights when in the still light of the cheerful moon on every twig and rail and jutting spout the icy spears were adding to their length against the arrows of the coming sun how in the shimmering noon of summer past some unrecorded beam slanted across the upland pastures where the johnswort grew or heard amid the verdure of my mind the bee's long smothered hum on the blue flag loitering amidst the mead or busy rill which now through all its course stands still and dumb its own memorial purling at its play along the slopes and through the meadows next until its youthful sound was hushed at last in the staid current of the lowland stream or seeing the furrows shine but late upturned and where the field fare followed in the rear when all the fields around lay bound in hoar beneath a thick entugament of snow so by god's cheap economy made rich to go upon my winter's task again end of poem this recording is in the public domain stanzas written at walden by henry david thoreau read for librivox dot org by larry wilson when winter fringes every bough with his fantastic wreath and puts the seal of silence now upon the leaves beneath when every stream in its penthouse goes gurgling on its way and in his gallery the mouse nibbleth the meadow hay methinks the summer still is nigh and lurketh underneath as that same meadow mouse doth lie snug in that last year's heath and if perchance the chickadee lisp a faint note anon the snow is summer's canopy which she herself put on fair blossoms deck the cheerful trees and dazzling fruits depend the north wind sighs a summer breeze the nipping frost defend bringing glad tidings unto me the while i stand all ear of a serene eternity which need not winter fear out on the silent pond straightway the restless ice doth crack and pond sprites merry gambols play amid the deafening rack eager i hasten to the vale as if i heard brave news how nature held high festival which it were hard to lose i gambol with my neighbor ice and sympathizing quake as each new crack darts in a trice across the gladsome lake one with a cricket in the ground and faggot on the hearth resounds the rare domestic sound along the forest path end a poem this recording is in the public domain the thaw by henry david thoreau read for librivox .org by larry wilson i saw the civil sun drying earth's tears her tears of joy that only faster flowed fain would i stretch me by the highway side to thaw and trickle with the melting snow that mingled soul and body with the tide i too may through the pores of nature flow in the poem this recording is in the public domain a winter scene by henry david thoreau read for librivox .org by larry wilson the rabbit leaps the mouse out creeps the flag out peeps beside the brook the ferret weeps the marmot sleeps the owlet keeps in his snug nook the apples thaw the ravens caw the squirrels gnaw the frozen fruit to their retreat i track the feet of mice that eat the apple's root the snow dust falls the otter crawls the partridge calls far in the wood the traveller dreams the tree ice gleams the blue jay screams in angry mood the willows droop the alders stoop the pheasants group beneath the snow 
The catkins green cast o'er the scene a summer's sheen, a genial glow. In the poem, this recording is in the public domain. The Crow by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Thou dusky spirit of the wood, bird of an ancient brood, flitting thy lonely way, a meteor in the summer's day, from wood to wood, from hill to hill, low over forest, field, and rill, what wouldst thou say? Why shouldst thou haunt the day? What makes thy melancholy float? What bravery inspires thy throat, and bears thee up above the clouds, over desponding human crowds, which far below lay thy haunts low? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Stray Fowl by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Poor bird, destined to lead thy life far in the adventurous west, and here to be debarred to-night from thy accustomed nest. Must thou fall back upon old instinct now, well nigh extinct under man's fickle care? Did heaven bestow its quenchless inner light so long ago for thy small want to-night? Why stands it upon thy toes to grow so late? The moon is deaf to thy low-feathered fate. Or dost thou think so to possess the night, And people the drear dark with thy brave sprite? And now with anxious eye thou look'st about, While the relentless shade draws on its veil For some sure shelter from approaching dews, And the insidious step of nightly foes. I fear imprisonment has dulled thy wit, Or ingrained servitude extinguished it. But no, dim memory of the days of yore, by Brahmaputra and the Juma's shore, where thy proud race flew swiftly o'er the heath, and sought its food the jungle's shade beneath, has taught thy wings to seek yon friendly trees, as erst by Indus bank and the far Ganges. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mountains by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson With frontier strength ye stand your ground, With grand content ye circle round, Tumultuous silence for all sound. Ye distant nursery of rills, Monadnock and the Peterborough hills, Firm argument that never stirs, Outcircling the philosophers like some vast fleet, sailing through rain and sleet through winter's cold and summer's heat still holding on upon your high emprise until ye find a shore amid the skies not skulking close to land with cargo contraband for they who sent a venture out by ye have set the sun to see their honesty ships of the line each one ye westward run convoying clouds which cluster in your shrouds always before the gale under a press of sail with weight of metal all untold i seem to feel ye in my firm seat here immeasurable depth of hold and breadth of beam and length of running gear methinks ye take luxurious pleasure in your novel western leisure so cool your brows and freshly blue as time had not for ye to do for ye lie at your length an unappropriated strength unhewn primeval timber for knees so stiff, for mass so limber, the stock of which new earths are made, one day to be our western trade, fit for the stanchions of a world, which through the seas of space is hurled. While we enjoy a lingering ray, ye still o'ertop the western day, reposing yonder on God's croft like solid stacks of hay. So bold a line as ne'er was writ on any page by human wit, the forest glows as if an enemy's campfire shone along the horizon, or the day's funeral pyre were lighted there. Edged with silver and with gold, the clouds hang o'er in damask fold, and with fresh depth of amber light, the west is dight. 
where still a few rays slant that even heaven seems extravagant watatic hill lies on the horizon sill like a child's toy left overnight another does to left and right on the earth's edge mountains and trees stand as they were on air graven or as the vessels in a haven await the morning breeze i fancy even through your defiles windeth the way to heaven and yonder still in spite of history's page linger the golden and the silver age upon the laboring gale the news of future centuries is brought and of new dynasties of thought from your remotest vale but special i remember thee wachusett who like me standest alone without society thy far blue eye a remnant of the sky seen through the clearing of the gorge or from the windows of the forge doth leaven all it passes by nothing is true but stands between me and you thou western pioneer who knowest not shame nor fear by venturous spirit driven under the eaves of heaven and canst expand thee there and breathe enough of air even beyond the west thou migratest into unclouded tracts without a pilgrim's axe cleaving thy road on high with thy well-tempered brow and makes thyself a clearing in the sky upholding heaven holding down earth thy pastime from thy birth not steadied by the one nor leaning on the other may i approve myself thy worthy brother in the poem this recording is in the public domain the respectable folks by henry david thoreau read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson the respectable folks where dwell they they whisper in the oaks and they sigh in the hay summer and winter night and day out on the meadow there dwell they they never die nor snivel nor cry nor ask our pity with a wet eye a sound estate that they ever mend to every asker readily lend to the ocean wealth to the meadow health to time his length to the rock's strength to the star's light to the weary night to the busy day to the idle play and so their good cheer never ends for all are their debtors and all their friends end of poem this recording is in the public domain poverty a fragment by henry david thoreau read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson if i am poor it is that i am proud if god has made me naked and a boor he did not think it fit his work to shroud the poor man comes direct from heaven to earth as stars drop down the sky and tropic beams the rich receives in our gross air his birth as from low suns are slanted golden gleams yon sun is naked bare of satellite unless our earth and moon that office hold though his perpetual day feareth no night and his perennial summer dreads no cold mankind may delve but cannot my wealth spend if i no partial wealth appropriate no armored ships unto the indies send none robs me of my orient estate in the poem this recording is in the public domain conscience by henry david thoreau read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson conscience is instinct bred in the house feeling and thinking propagate the sin by an unnatural breeding in and in i say turn it outdoors into the moors i love a life whose plot is simple and does not thicken with every pimple a soul so sound no sickly conscience binds it that makes the universe no worse than it finds it i love an earnest soul whose mighty joy and sorrow are not drowned in a bowl and brought to life to-morrow that lives one tragedy and not seventy a conscience worth keeping laughing not weeping a conscience wise and steady and for ever ready not changing with events dealing in compliments a conscience exercised about large things 
where one may doubt. I love a soul not all of wood, predestinated to be good, but true to the backbone unto itself alone, and false to none, born to its own affairs, its own joys and own cares, by whom the work which God begun is finished and not undone, taken up where he left off, whether to worship or to scoff. If not good, why then evil? If not good God, good devil. Goodness, you, hypocrite, come out of that. Live your life, do your work, then take your hat. I have no patience towards such conscientious cowards. Give me simple laboring folk who love their work, whose virtue is a song to cheer God along. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pilgrims by Henry David Thoreau, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Have you not seen in ancient times pilgrims pass by toward other climes? With shining faces, youthful and strong, mounting this hill with speech and with song. Ah, my good sir, I know not those ways, little my knowledge, though many my days. When I have slumbered, I have heard sounds as of travellers passing these my grounds twas a sweet music wafted them by i could not tell if afar off or nigh unless i dreamed it this was of yore i never told it to mortal before never remembered but in my dreams what to me waking a miracle seems in the poem this recording is in the public domain THE DEPARTURE by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson In this roadstead I have ridden, In this covert I have hidden. Friendly thoughts were cliffs to me, And I hid beneath their lee. This true people took the stranger, And warm-hearted housed the ranger. They received their roving guest, And have fed him with the best. Whatsoe'er the land afforded, to the stranger's wish accorded, shook the olive, stripped the vine, and expressed the strengthening wine. And by night they did spread o'er him what by day they spread before him. That good will which was repast was his covering at last. The stranger moored him to their peer without anxiety or fear. By day he walked the sloping land, by night the gentle heavens he scanned. When first his bark stood inland, to the coast of that far Finland, sweet-watered brooks came tumbling to the shore, the weary mariner to restore. And still he stayed from day to day, if he their kindness might repay. But more and more the sullen waves came rolling toward the shore. And still the more the stranger waited, the less his argosy was freighted. And still the more he stayed, the less his debt was paid. So he unfurled his shrouded mast to receive the fragrant blast, and that same refreshing gale which had wooed him to remain, again and again, it was that filled his sail and drove him to the main. All day the low-hung clouds dropped tears into the sea, and the wind amid the shrouds sighed plaintively. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Independence by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson My life more civil is and free Than any civil polity. Ye princes, keep your realms And circumscribed power, Not wide as are my dreams, Nor rich as is this hour. What can ye give which I have not? What can ye take which I have got? Can ye defend the dangerless? Can ye inherit nakedness? To all true wants, time's ear is deaf. Penurious states lend no relief out of their pelf. But a free soul, thank God, can help itself. Be sure your fate doth keep apart its state, not linked with any band, even the noblest in the land. In tented fields with cloth of gold, no place doth hold, but is more chivalrous than they are 
and sigheth for a nobler war a finer strain its trumpet rings a brighter gleam its armor flings the life that i aspire to live no man proposeth me no trade upon the street wears its emblazonry end of poem this recording is in the public domain ding dong by henry david thoreau read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson when the world grows old by the chimney side then forth to the youngling nooks i glide where over the water and over the land the bells are booming on either hand now up they go ding then down again dong and a while they ring to the same old song for the metal goes round at a single bound a cutting the fields with its measured sound while the tired tongue falls with a lengthened boom as solemn and loud as the crack of doom then changed is their measured tone upon tone and seldom it is that one sound comes alone for they ring out their peals in a mingled throng and the breezes waft the loud ding-dong along when the echo hath reached me in this lone vale i am straightway a hero in coat of mail i tug up my belt and i march on my post and feel myself more than a match for a host end of poem this recording is in the public domain my prayer by henry david thoreau read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson great god i ask thee for no meaner pelf than that i may not disappoint myself that in my action i may soar as high as i can now discern with this clear eye and next in value which thy kindness lends that i may greatly disappoint my friends howe'er they think or hope that it may be they may not dream how thou'st distinguished me that my weak hand may equal my firm faith and my life practice more than my tongue saith that my low conduct may not show nor my relenting lines that i thy purpose did not know or overrated thy designs end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of poems of nature by henry david thoreau